Well, I'm going to start talking because my clock says 1930. I'm Lance Butler. I'm um, about to become the chairman of the Arthur Conan Doyle Center, which will be a great privilege. And I'm hosting this for the center. It's wonderful to see uh, so many people. That's, um, that's nearly 50 people already. And you're all extremely welcome. These Zoom talks uh, seem, seem to me to have been going pretty well. And they're every Tuesday evening. And I sincerely hope you'll keep on coming back, of course. Uh, no pressure, Ian, but that depends on the quality of the speakers. However, you can, <laughs> you can uh, have your laugh on me because I shall be giving a talk in a month or so's time. But we have some very um, interesting people coming up. We've got a professor from Bristol next next um, Tuesday uh, who is talking about magic and, and spirituality in the Gothic. And after that, we have the, the following Tuesday on the 27th, we have the, the young, keen young panpsychist from Durham University called Philip Goff. But um, that oh, yeah. will all be apparent in your, in your uh, emails that you get and on our website, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle Center. Tonight, we have Ian McGilchrist, who is, seems to be one of the, if he'll f shut his ears for a moment, one of the great intellectuals of our time. He, he was in my discipline, English literature um, at Oxford, and he was a distinguished don, a, a distinguished student and don, uh, to the point that he sat for and became elected to the college All Souls, which is about as high as you can get in most academic spheres. And having succeeded with All Souls and been a very good English don, he published a book called Against Criticism, packed the thing in and started to become a doctor. And he was a doctor and a psychiatrist and, and very well respected and very serious. But he's always had both sides, which of course is what we really like, both the intellectual side and the more exploratory and alternative side, which involves the arts and involves the spirit and so on. And uh, in 2009, he published his magnum opus called, as many of you know, um, The Master and His Emissary, which had an enormous success and has had him invited all over the world to speak about what it's about, which is the two halves of the brain. for you know, over the millennia um, because he can approach both the scientific side and the artistic side and of course he's no slouch on, on the spiritual side either so I'm really really pleased um, that Ian is here um, he's just finished he's just told me that the book that I've watched him writing for the last several years he's just sent it to the publisher and it's a sign of the times and it's a sign of Ian's extraordinary erudition that when I said what's it going to be called he said to me well it's so big, it may have to be two books, so it may have to have two names. Um, this is a man who has read practically everything in our sphere and many others. Um, I'm not gonna go on. I'll just to say that if you have any questions for Ian, which I hope you do, we don't do the old fashioned Q and A. Um, could you please just address the questions to everyone uh, on, in the chat column? And I will then monitor and present them to Ian at the end. That way we avoid confusion. Anyway, look, enough of me. Ian, you are speaking about the School of Nothing Buttery, which is rather a jolly title, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Lance, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm really genuinely very sorry that it is not, uh, as it were, me in the flesh. I'm speaking to you from some ethereal realm on sky. But, uh, but there we are. I, I would love to, to come to Edinburgh one day and speak. Yeah. Um, what I'm best known for is... Uh, Lance has intimated is uh, the idea that my my brain is divided in two, and and a, a number of people have uh, uh, something seems to have happened. I don't know quite what, but Lynn is now on my screen. But anyway, um, I hope you can still hear me. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the the business of the divided brain. Um, what I wanted to say is that since writing the Master in Emissary, I've gone on to write the book that um, uh, Lance referred to, which I'm hoping will be called The Matter with Things, which is in effect um, a sort of taking apart of the reductionist position which so much dominates our world, not just in science, but in public discourse about pretty much everything in the philosophy and the spirituality, uh, as well as the arts and uh, just about all that we believe about ourselves and who we are. So I address Plotinus's question, 
who are we in the book? And I do it, of course, as I do everything through the lens of the two hemispheres. And I think this is um, relevant to what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I take the, the phrase, the school of nothing buttery, actually from a, a, a former Oxford colleague of mine, alas, now deceased, the philosopher J.R. Lucas, who had a very nice sense of humor. And uh, like me, he was um, pretty unimpressed by the idea that the way you find out about something is simply to take it to parts and find that it consists of pretty much nothing at all. Uh, and therefore was all along nothing to be concerned about, um, let alone to love. And uh, just one of the hemispheres would be likely to, to adopt this, this, this position. Sometimes people think that maybe I'm being rather reductionist to talk about the mind through the, an image of the brain. But in fact, I'm not, because I'm not reducing mental activity, something I'll come on to talk about, to the brain in any sense at all. I'm just saying that it constrains the ways in which we think about the world. So um, just in a few sentences, what is relevant about the two ways in which our two hemispheres um, deal with the world? It's not that uh, one of them uh, does, uh, as it were, logic and science and maths, and the other one does sort of painting and um, makes pretty pictures and, and hums little tunes like Pooh Bear. And it's actually nothing to do with what they do because they're both concerned with everything. It's that the, the way in which they do it. And a lot of people will be very surprised to learn that the best contributions to science and maths, in fact, the, the work of the great scientists and the great mathematicians relies very much on what I can demonstrate is effectively the right hemisphere not the left, or more the right hemisphere, in fact. Rote calculation, uh, simply analyzing things into bits, yes, that is what the left hemisphere is very skilled at. But actually understanding what's going on, seeing connections and seeing the shape of things is not its strong suit. So effectively, what I believe is that the left hemisphere has this take on the world which prioritizes one little part of it. This has a, an evolutionary basis in that we need, in order to exist at all, to be able to focus on something that we require, whether it be food or a, or a twig to build a nest or whatever it might be, and we need to do so accurately, sharply, and be able to manipulate it. At the same time, we need to be able to keep a wide open, sustained attention to the whole scene so that we know there's a predator coming or uh, those are my kin that I need to be getting food to. So th that's the basis of the idea. And because of this, effectively, the left hemisphere has a very, very tiny, very narrow, probably about 3% of the, or sorry, 3 degrees of the whole 360 degrees arc, uh, which is very much in focus. And uh, that is all that it sees at any one time. Uh, the right hemisphere sees the whole picture, including the extremes on both left and right. And what this leads to is a vision in the left hemisphere of a world that is made up of bits, that is actually composed of things that are not connected, they're discrete fragments. They are static, because that's how you grab them, you fix them and you get them. Um, they are taken out of context because all the context has been sheared off. Um, they are largely abstract, one's sense of what they are in one's life and in an embodied experience is not part of what the left hemisphere is interested in. They're categorized and they're no longer unique. So you have this world made up of little bits that you put together in order to make, ah, I see, I've got a bicycle. Whereas the right hemisphere is seeing that nothing is ever completely distinct from anything else at all, that things are never static, but are involved in a three or four or five dimensional universe with many other things, that they constantly flow and change, um, and that they um, are things to which we are connected. We're not sitting in a kind of powerfully detached, almost psychopathic position of um, observation whereby we work out what we want to do to manipulate things. So these give two completely different um, 
pictures of the world. One is a bureaucrat's dream, that's the left hemisphere's one, and the other is a bureaucrat's nightmare because it's very hard to pin it down. So when we come to the idea of what we see, we're given two versions, basically. What I hinted at quite strongly in The Master and His Emissary and make very plain in the first part of the new book is that we can go a little further than saying there are just two visions. We can very strongly prefer one as more in touch with reality. Now, uh, it has been put to me that how can you say that? Because if it's all coming through the two hemispheres, you'd need a third hemisphere that judges the, the first two. But it's not actually like that. Um, as I think one of the greatest philosophers of the last 100, 120 years, uh, William James uh, pointed out, and as the whole pragmatist movement, including the brilliant C.S. Peirce, John Dewey, um, and so on, is that... <clears throat> Things are tested out on experience. Now, I suppose you had two um, flight controls in your cockpit and they gave you different information. You needed them both for different things at different times, but they seem to be giving you know, different information that didn't exactly go here. You were getting on fine. And you were told you, I'm afraid one of them's got to go down. We haven't got enough power for both. You're only going to have to live on one. The test of which one is more in touch with reality is which one will keep you in the air longer? Which one will um, crash you into a mountainside rather quickly? And my contention is that if you follow the image of the left hemisphere, you crash into the mountainside rather quickly. I believe that is indeed what we are hastening to do in the um, 21st century. Um, and we haven't got very much time because we're approaching that mountainside extremely fast. So one can judge these things. And what I've looked at is the nature of the attention that the hemispheres pay to the world, the quality of their perceptions, which you can test against reality, um, the, the reality and subtlety of judgments that are made on the reality that is attended to and perceived, um, how much it is actually understood both in terms of emotional and social intelligence, which is an enormous part of our life, and how much just in terms of good old fashioned IQ, cognitive intelligence, and which is better at enabling us to make the imaginative move to whatever it is that we're trying to understand. And in every single case, I can demonstrate that the right hemisphere is superior. So we can get the signature of the right hemisphere because it sees a certain kind of shape when it looks at the world that is not pinnable down, is never ultimately knowable, is always in process, is constantly connected with everything else. And we know the imprint of the deceitful left hemisphere, which there are just dead bits that have to be put together. Now that's condensed, uh, I think, 437 pages. Um, so uh, <laughs> I won't say much more about, about that, except to make a contrast between two ways of thinking about an understanding. One is the analysis, where you, you say you take it apart, you take it apart, and you can carry on this process going down to cells, down to genes, down to atoms, down to subatomic particles. You can carry it on as far as you like until you can't find anything that you can actually specify at all, um, and you're left with nothing. This vanishing trick seems particularly difficult for people who pride themselves on not deceiving themselves to see through. But the other way is to see not by going down, but by going up, because if everything is connected, it says as much about me that I'm composed of cells as it tells you about a cell that it can go to make me. And this is true, not just of living things, but throughout the universe. Um, it tells you about the simplest things, as Alfred North Whitehead um, made very clear, what it is that they can ultimately come to be and express as much as doing it the other way around. Why always look downwards? Why not look upwards? Because a very simple thing, there tends to be a culture of, has been for a hundred years or so, a somewhat nihilistic one of seeing the human being as a 
a lonely alien in the universe, struggling to find meaning, struggling to make beauty, struggling to love. But what I'd like to point out is there's nowhere but out of the universe that love, imagination, creativity, beauty can come. Where do they come if they don't come out of that same cosmos? It's a fact that the cosmos has it in it to produce Bach's B minor mass. That is a fact. It's not my opinion. Now, if that's the case, it says something very interesting about the stuff of the cosmos. So the other way of looking at things is what overall whole that defies analysis into parts does it go to make? And the term that is most helpful here, we don't have a word in English, is the German word Gestalt. The Gestalt means the overall figuration, the overall sense of the whole that is lost when you start taking it apart. Now, science would do very well not to have, as it has done over the last 200 years, become divorced from philosophy. And philosophy would have been well not to get divorced from science. They've both lost by it. And in my writing, I try to bring them together and enrich both. There's a rather unfortunate race to the bottom, which is when they do pay attention to one another. I mean, actually, science is not really interested in philosophy because it will, they feel it would sort of, it's rather irrelevant and hold them up on their um, getting the next prize. Um, and it just seems to them obvious uh, because they've never been, I'm afraid, many of them trained in, in anything like philosophy, that the universe just is a machine and that people just are machines. And sometimes they're rather sort of hurt and surprised if you say, but that's not obvious at all. And seem to think, oh, really? I mean, how could you think differently? So um, scientists don't think much of philosophy. And a lot of the time philosophers just think, philosophers just think that science is somehow beneath them really and can't tell them anything. Now, I think both of these traditions are mistaken. Um, of course, philosophy can enormously sophisticate what science um, tells it. Um, and um, science can be enormously sophisticated by philosophy and, and, and informed by philosophy and enriched by it. But what I'm afraid is happening is that scientists go, well, I'm afraid when we look at everything, it's just a machine. And the philosophers go, yeah, well, probably the best uh, philosophy for dealing with it is a mechanistic philosophy. So we're really losing out. And one of the things I hope to aim with this next book is that I, I break that vicious loop in which we uh, hurry one another to the bottom as fast as possible. Now, in the time that's left to me, I haven't, I can't go over very much, but I thought I'd take three examples of what I mean about how damaging this way of thinking can be. And the first one is really just to demonstrate how absurd it is. In my life, and maybe in yours, one of the most meaningful things of all is music. Now, if you take music apart, you get phrases and then finally you get notes. And then you go, oh, at last, I've put it into my cloud chamber and I can definitively affirm that music is made of notes. Um, round of applause. Now, what is a note? Once we know what a note is, we can work out what music is. Um, but of course, a note is, well, nothing really. It's just a meaningless sound. Um, and if you put um, thousands and thousands and thousands of these together, you get Mozart's G minor quintet, which probably means more than anything that you can encounter in the world. How does that happen? It can't be in the notes. We've established that because one note means nothing, two notes mean nothing, three notes mean nothing, and presumably, therefore, 35,000 notes mean nothing. So it must be in something else. Well, the only things that there are are gaps. There's just silence, which is the gaps between the notes in the melody, the gaps between the notes in the harmony as they occur at the same time, and the ictus of the way in which the thing moves. But the silence on its own doesn't mean anything either. So this is a perfect example of a gestalt. And to me, a much better image of the universe is a symphony or a dance or a beautiful piece of choral music rather than the machine. I don't just say that in some um, flowery poetic way. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with the in insights of poetry, um, but I mean it in a very deep philosophical way that we misunderstand it. 
And of course, the other thing about music is that it simply cannot be understood except in an act of encounter. It's not there and you can look at it and go away and inspect it. You have to encounter it. Now that is a very good image of everything in our lives, everything in our experience, and I would say of the nature of the cosmos. The second thing that I would look at is something that will take me a little bit longer, but which is really very important to me because after all, uh, I'm a doctor, um, I've worked in the area of neurology and psychiatry and very prominent in the life sciences, as they're called, is the image of the machine. Now, physics, curiously, moved on from um, the image of a machine about 100 years ago. It decided that simply the cosmos is nothing like anything mechanical at all. However, this message hasn't got through to certain prominent public intellectuals in the realm of the biological sciences who carry on in a, a perfect frock-coated mid-19th century way to see uh, the whole business of the living world as mechanical. And we must stop conceiving of not only living beings as things, uh, sorry, not as just as machines, but as things at all. They're processes. And in the last 18 months, I've been very excited by discovering a book called Everything Flows, quoting Heraclitus, the greatest philosopher that ever lived. And it's by uh, Dupre and Nicholson, published by OUP. Uh, and I do recommend it to everyone. I, I think on a policy of OUPs, you can in fact read it online for free. Um, and it has an uh, enormous amount in it but it effectively takes apart the idea that living beings are anything at all like a machine. And the information in it is staggering. What is fascinating, of course, is that at one level, of course, neurology, at least neuroscience, uh, which is perhaps a, a less humane thing than neurology, where you were forced to confront suffering humanity every day, uh, in neuroscience in the lab, you're not, it's easier to think of what you're looking at as just some little circuit or some something mechanical. And so the language of neuroscience is full of feedback loops, um, uh, circuits, gates that open and close and um, parcels of information and so forth. Whereas um, in fact, when people start talking about cells, including neurons, but all cells, they, cannot help using a language which absolutely wouldn't be necessary or tolerated in physics or chemistry. They talk about a cell designing something, helping something, um, forming something, um, promoting something, uh, interpreting something, messaging something, all things that only living things actually do. There's a lot to say about that disjunct, but let me just allow that to, to tick away there. And then, of course, we've inherited from Richard Dawkins this very silly idea that we are just um, the tools of machine-like robots um, that enable them to do whatever it is they do. Interestingly, this is actually just a transposition of the idea of an engineering god. It's saying that we don't do things, something else does things to us and controls us except that his idea of the engineering God is contained in a gene. And I, I don't hold with an engineering God. A God, depending on what it means, maybe, but that's another matter. Well, first of all, genes don't determine very much at all. They are, according to Lewontin, as very great biologist, some of the most inactive molecules in biology. They are more like a storehouse on which the cell can draw as it needs. The cell acts on the genome. And in fact, in some creatures, this is an extreme case, but we all living creatures do it up to a point. But there is a very small single celled organism that regularly junks about 90% of its genome and refashions the order of the rest on orders from the cell. And that's a huge thing. When we'd finished this heroic task of decoding the genome, we found that there was just not enough information there. The image that always comes to mind, I'm sure 
all of us over a certain age at any rate have seen Faulty Towers, possibly more than once. And there is a wonderful episode, probably the best of the whole lot, where um, uh, the, the chef has got drunk and Basil Faulty has to go and get a duck from his friend uh, Andre, a chef in town, and comes back smirking, pushing his trolley with the silver uh, dish, and he pulls the lid off and there's a blancmange. And she says nothing, but just goes, and then goes, ducks off. Um, and that's the end. But I'm afraid the discovery at the end of this trail of the genome is just like that. It's not there. How many genes does the human being have? About 26,000. Actually, depending on what you define as a gene, you might think a gene is a clear, discrete concept, but actually it's not. But we normally say about 26,000, whereas a blind millimeter long um, worm, uh, uh, C. elegans, uh, has 19,000. Um, a very small water flea called Daphnia pulex has, I think, 39,000. And the biggest genome of all is one species of amoeba that has something like 200 times as much genomic content as the human genome. Now, on top of that, only 2% of the genome is thought actually to be um, active. I mean, we'll probably discover um, how foolish that idea is, but at the moment, 98% is called junk DNA. It doesn't leave you very much with which to conjure the extraordinary complexity. So that in even one single cell, 10,000 different reactions are going on every second with pathways that are not simple and discrete, but interlocked with one another. So what is important is the system as a whole, not just the genome, but the genome and the cell and the surrounding tissue and the whole being in which the whole thing is going on. Now, one of the first things that alerts you to the fact that organisms are not like cell and not like machines is that machines can be switched on and off. People can't, nor can hamsters. Um, but every machine I know can be switched on and off. You can switch it off for a few years, you can come, you can start it up, and on the whole, you will hope that after a few hiccups, it will carry on doing whatever it was doing. Now, that's not actually a small point, is what is happening is that there is a continuous process. We are processes, not things, not even aggregates of things. And what has to be explained in the human being is not motion, as in a machine. How does this come to move? Well, because we burn a lot of things in a power station, we plug it in and it then starts moving, then we switch it off. No, we change all the time to remain the same. In fact, this is a saying of Heraclitus is, by changing, it remains the same. And this is absolutely true of a cell or of all, any living thing. In fact, the interesting thing is that in Greek, the word for change there is metabalon, which is basically the word in metabolism. So what we are doing, metabolizing, is changing all the time. And when you see a picture of a cell in a, a, a microphotograph or in a, a drawing in a textbook, it looks like it has clear boundaries. But actually, it's not. Those boundaries that look solid are actually fluid and things are coming into them and going out of them all the time. They're more like rivers than they are like walls. The process of evolution as well, natural selection. Natural selection is not the, the bringer of change. Change is there automatically in nature all the time, fluidly changing in response to the environment. It's a dance. Natural selection is a stabilizer. It goes, hang on, hang on we quite like that one. Uh, we're going to fix it. So it's actually not what it is often taken to be. Nor are these systems uh, linear systems in any sense at all. I've already mentioned that they often have recursive loops in which they act on themselves. Um, and in fact, Sidney Brenner, who won a Nobel Prize for his work in genetics, says that basically in the cell, it's everything doing everything to everything else. So um, the idea that one can get to simplicity as one goes on the way down is absolutely not right. Nor can you fix anything as a single component because everything is interdependent. So everything depends on its place in the whole. 
And um, in a machine, you know, you've got a widget or a tap it or whatever it is, and you can take it out, rub it clean, put it back in again, whatever. But in a human or a, an animal or a single cell or the, the, the simplest living thing, you, you don't have this business of independence. There's a very nice little book by a quite young um, microbiologist called Kriti Sharma um, called Interdependence, uh, which I found very impressive, um, in which she says it's not just, as we know, that the organism is always in dialogue with the environment, because one tends to think that the organism has an effect on the environment, and then the, organ the environment has an effect on the organism, and then etc. But it's not and then. The two come into being together because of one another, rather like the piece of music. Nor is it in any sense a predictable matter what a gene will do. It depends entirely on the context. In a very gross way, for example, um, probably any of you who've done school biology will know that the eye of a fly, compound eye, the eye of a frog and a human eye are really very different, both to look at in how, and in how they function. But the principal gene that codes for them is the same in every case, it's PAX6. I mean, of course, there are other gen genomic differences, but the point I'm making is this, that what a gene does can't be predicted until you know pretty much about everything about all the other genes. So that a single gene can produce as many as 2000 different proteins on different occasions. So what does it code for? It's not a straightforward matter. And indeed, while the same outcome can be derived from a number of different genetic cellular streams, equally, the same elements can give rise to many, many different outcomes. So, as it were, in both directions, you've got a fan, not a straight line. So the whole is very important in its influence. And of course, again, living things, as I've rather emphasized, don't have precise boundaries. Um, uh, I, I mean, of course, psychically, one may well know that, but I mean, it's not foreign at all to mainstream biology that the brain and the heart give off waves that are detectable within feet around it. But also that, you know, I am partly what my environment uh, gives to me and what I give to it. There isn't a sharp boundary at the edge of me. And of course, the final thing is that um, living things bootstrap. They're often compared with, you know, mindlessly to computers. But it's not for a computer, a computer can build another computer, but it already has to have the information. Um, it doesn't generate the information in the process of becoming the machine. You can't just put a lot of things together and hope that they will generate information at the same time as the thing that the, gen the information refers to. Um, and in this, living things are again very different. So I would suggest that a much better image for all living things and quite possibly for inanimate things, which I don't think are wholly distinct from living things. I think they are, if you like, a limit case of the living, but that would take us away from, I can't cover that now. But the, a better image would be the flow of life or the stream of life um, than that of the machine. And there's nothing nebulous about that. A stream has enormous force. It can change things. It can move boulders. It creates whirlpools that you can photograph that will propel you. So it's very, very real, um, except that each eddy in the stream, each part of the flow is not in any sense disconnected from any other part in the flow. Now, I said I would uh, talk about three elements. I spoke about music. I spoke about the disconnect between an organism and a machine very, very, very sketchily and briefly. And I now want even more sketchily and briefly just to touch on matter and consciousness. Of course, it's a huge topic. When I last spoke about it, I did it for two hours. So I'm going to talk about it for 10 minutes. Effectively, The mainstream culture prioritizes matter because it prioritizes things. And hence my title, The Matter with Things, the way you see the world is wrong. And when it has to decide what the heck consciousness is, it imagines it must emerge from things, from matter. 
And of course, uh, a brain is material. And a brain certainly seems to run in parallel with consciousness. Uh, when things happen to the brain, they affect consciousness. There's no question about it. That's been known for a couple of thousand years. But the assumption that matter leads to consciousness is no better grounded, in fact, I would argue less well grounded than the idea that consciousness gives rise to matter. There are three possibilities indeed that matter emits consciousness, um, that it transmits consciousness, or that it permits consciousness. And in this, it's like a TV set. If an alien were to land in this world and to inspect a TV set, uh, it wouldn't be able to tell whether it transmitted something or generated something because the machinery would look the same. Now, I, in brief, I haven't got time to do the argument, but I can argue that easily the least probable of these is the idea that matter in some form emits consciousness. Um, First of all, we haven't the slightest clue. Nobody has even the vestige of a clue how matter could give rise, unconscious matter could give rise to consciousness. And as Walter, uh, sorry, not Walter, William James um, uh, pointed out, it's rather like a story in Midship and Easy, a 19th century novel in which a woman who's had um, an illegitimate child excuses it by going, but if you please, sir, it's a very little one. The idea that there might be a very little consciousness uh, before consciousness, as it were, just the kind of ghost of consciousness about to be, doesn't help us, because either it's conscious or it isn't. And if it's conscious in any degree, the same problem uh, exists. It's not like things that emerge. It's not like flow emerging from H2O molecules. There's something about the chemistry of H2O molecules that we know predicts that they will flow when there are mass of them. But there is nothing about the nature of matter that says that under any circumstances, it can give rise to consciousness. Also, I would point out that I know that I only know consciousness because of matter. I know that for certain. What I don't know Are we ever going to know what Ian doesn't know? Scott, is there a recording going on? Yes. I noticed that in the top left hand corner, when Ian freezes, it always says recording. We may have to put the recording onto, a, onto the back burner, as it were, I think. Hmm. I think Ian is no longer with us. Ah, we've lost him. I wouldn't put the recording onto the back burner. I would wait, maybe invite Ian to join us again. Yes. Shall I ring him up? Yes. Why don't you invite, why don't you try and do the inv inviting while I ring him up? Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen, it hasn't happened before. Oh. No, he's got his phone off. <laughs> We're struggling a bit. Lance, you might want to explain where Ian actually is. Yes, I'm phoning him now. Um, Ian lives at Talisker House on the extreme west-hand side of the Isle of Skye. Um, it's a very beautiful place. But of course, he's been he likes living up there alone um, anyway, but in the last nine months, he's been locked down up there and unable really to leave, which is what's enabled him to write this immense book. Um, right, yes, he's not answering that phone either. He's, he's a remarkable chap, and he's been up there for quite a number of years, um, and he has a, a, a large study and a large library, but of course, he writes in the kitchen next to the Arga like the rest of us. <laughs> he's a tremendous chap. And I've been up there a few times, but of course I haven't been able to go up recently either. Um, now, yes, what have we got in the chat? Yes. 
it happens. Well, <laughs> it, <I'm, laughs> it reminds me a bit of Bilbo Baggins, who just disappears at the right moment. <laughs> yes. Yes, at least everyone was having a party with a few drinks. I don't know. Perhaps the audience is having a party. <laughs> as we... I hope so. Um, so, Scott, do we think there's anything we can do about this? Um, I'm going to send him the link again. Um, so hopefully he's still got access to email, but if his internet connection has dropped, he probably won't get my He email. won't get that either. Well, look. What here, we are, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. There he oh. is. Oh, well done. Yes. By, by, by an amazing resurrection, here I am. And, and I was going to be perfect and uh, finish uh, after exactly <laughs> five minutes, but I'm going to, no, I'm probably you, going to do my best enough. to do so even, even, <laughs> even now. But I think what I'd said was that it seems to me clear that um, I know the consciousness that I know Sorry, I know the matter I know because of consciousness, but it's not clear that I know that the consciousness because of matter. That may be the case or it may not. So um, there's an awful lot to say, but the first thing is that um, neurons are not necessary for consciousness. And there are cases of people who have certainly almost no cortex, whatever, um, of, uh, and yet are able to function at a simple level. And there's a case of um, a chap who got a first class degree in mathematics from Leeds um, and had an IQ of um, nearly 130 um, uh, and was uh, found to have only a tiny rim of brain, very, very much smaller than, um, than the normal brain. Um, and as I say, there are people who are, um, have a very special, unusual condition um, in which they don't have cerebral cortex at all, and yet they can recognize people, they can behave socially, they can enjoy music, uh, and so forth. And people think that it, I, I never got this argument, but people say things like, well, it emerges out of all the connections. Well, yes, that's fine. It's slightly like the idea that if you just put more and more notes together, magically notes will do something. But it's, it's actually more than that. It's, it, it's something come out of the notes, it's the form. And the form is not actually in the notes at all. So the form is not in the connections. One thing that I find very striking, you probably know, is that the cerebellum, the ancient part of the brain, uh, at the posterior part of the, of the brain, has four times as many neurons as the cerebrum, the part which maintains consciousness for us. And it's not that they're not very interconnected, they have some of the most sophisticated and most interconnected cells in the human body, Purkinje neurons. So it simply isn't a case of multiplying connections because nobody has been conscious just with a cerebellum. And we now can see that plants can make decisions, can respond to situations, situations that they couldn't have been prepared for. Um, if anybody wants to ask me about them, I can describe experiments, but I probably haven't got time at the moment. But um, two rather interesting insights into, into what I'm saying are that so vital are some organs to creatures that the, the sense of the loss of them causes them to generate them even when they don't have the gene for it. So you can breed eyeless flies by deleting the gene for eyes and their offspring have no eyes. And you carry on. After 14 generations, they have eyes, but they don't have the gene. And it, even more astonishingly is that a certain, um, cili uh, certain um, ciliate organism, you can uh, remove the gene for the flagellum. And I have been told that even in a matter of days, it will generate a new flagellum, even though it now doesn't have the gene for it. Now, I'm not a geneticist, but this is what I'm reporting. And, and perhaps I've got time just to tell you the fun experiment about plants, because um, let's start with a simple one. Um, a sensitive plant, Mimosa pudica, um, is designed to close uh, if it's touched. And if you stroke the leaf, it will close. If you carry on doing that and it doesn't experience any harm, it will stop doing it. You might say, well, yes, it's fatigue. But if you drop a drop of water on it, which is different from a touch of a finger, it can tell the difference and it closes because it detects danger. So it's not straightforward. And here's 
something really remarkable. You can grow pea shoots <clears throat> in a circumstance in which they are craving light. And light can come to them down one arm or another of a Y-shaped tube. And the plant will get more light if it grows towards the tube down which the light is going to come. But the clever experimenter randomly varies it. But what the experimenter does is to send a puff of air down the tube sometime before the light is going to go on. And there are two sets, well, three, including a control. But in one experimental set, the advent of the puff of air means light will come down that same arm of the Y out of which the air came. In the other experimental setup, it's the other way around. When you experience the puff of air, the light is not going to come down that particular arm. And the plant is able to be trained in a quite short space of time to detect the air first and know that that's where the light is going to come from and grow towards the light. Uh, there are many other things. I mean, there's a whole literature on this, but the very idea that plants, which of course have no neurons at all, um, can't be conscious of things seems to me wrong. And we now know more and more about a very simple brains. I mean, the, the, the brain of a crow or a magpie is something of which humans may be frightened. They can do things that um, quite clever children can't do in terms of calculation, working out what's going on. And they have no neocortex at all. And the whole size of the brain is minute. Um, mind you, it's very profusely um, interconnected within itself, but there you are. It's an, it's an interesting observation. So well, I'd just like to end then with a, with a final few words. It seems to me that we've fallen under the spell of not just a way of thinking, but a way of being in the world, which is wrong. Um, we have a, a, a false set of values. And in the hierarchy of values that the philosopher Max Shaler drew up, at the base, there was the values of utility and the values of pleasure. And at the summit was the value of the holy. And in between, there was a, a level of what he called Lebenswerte, the sort of values of life, which were things like courage, um, magnanimity, fidelity, loyalty, uh, and those sort of things. And then above that um, was beauty, goodness, and truth. And then there was the holy. And it seems to me, um, and I say this in the master in his emissary, that the left hemisphere reduces all those higher things to a utility. The story is that the holy was invented so that priests could have a, um, um, a, a hierarchy, which literally is the, is the, um, the, 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 the uh, um, ascendancy of priests. Um, and the beauty, goodness and truth are things that society needs in order to um, guide copulation and hold the um, society together. The Lebenswerte are things that um, simple people do, uh, self-sacrifices for the value of the rest of the community, and that all in the end boils down to utility and pleasure. But I think the right hemisphere sees things in exactly the opposite direction, that things are useful in as, so much as they create something that actually gives to life and gives meaning to life, and that leads us to a place where we can experience beauty and goodness and truth, and ultimately the holy. And I'd like to suggest that whatever those terms mean, the meaning of a life comes from the journey towards them, whatever they are, and the effort to understand what they are and what they mean. And I don't think that we, as it were, give the meaning. We find the meaning. It's not an invention. It's a discovery. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, th Ian, thank you very much indeed. I, I like, I mean, Auf Hebung, you know, you, you want us to go up uh, to the hole and the holy rather than always going down to the, to the quantar or the grubs or the parts at the bottom. And you, and you end very, very strongly in that direction. Um, talking about going up, uh, amongst our, our, your hearers, um, Peter Bruin has pointed out that uh, when you started talking about music, it reminded him of the, 
of the music of the spheres, so that in a sense we're going full circle back to a very early religious notion. And this is followed up by, by Michael Hall um, asking about the German artistic romantic movement about which you know quite a lot, and its link of the human being and its brain uh, to nature, the proper relationship nature and the natural beauty of the cosmos. So that whether it's music or other kinds of beauty, um, I suppose uh, these two, um, listeners are are associating you with German Romanticism or even uh, the ancient Greeks with the music of the spheres. Do, do you like that kind of more that broader picture philosophically and historically? Absolutely, I like it very much and I accept it. Of course, um, again, as I say in The Master and His Emissary, we live in a world in which Romanticism has been associated with kind of intellectual slackness. But actually out of that unfortunately all too brief movement, principally in Germany and in England, uh, came absolutely the most sophisticated thinkers that I think our culture in modern times has produced. I mean, people like Goethe. Um, but above all, I mean, the discovery of mine, um, which is not a person who's much studied today, but Schelling. Um, uh, I, I used to and still am quite keen on Hegel, but Schelling has ascended in my pantheon above Hegel. Um, and all the things that you just mentioned would have been comprehensible to him because he was very interested in chemistry and physics. Um, he believed that when we lost the vision of the whole or the all as he called it, then a society crumbled and we tried to put things together from little particles of dust and couldn't succeed. He was absolutely visionary. So I accept that and I do think that uh, yes, the music of the spheres was uh, no silly thing. And, and in the conversation, which has been watched over a million times now that I had with um, Jordan Peterson, um, we got onto that very topic. I can, I can recommend that. Jo you just have to, easy to find on YouTube, um, Ian, with, with Jordan Peterson, two, two of our cleverer people, if I may say so. Before I go on to further comments from both Peter and Michael, um, can I just... Uh, thank Donna Sotomoretini, who has written in to say that your the book that you referred to, Everything Flows, is available um, on Amazon. Everything Flows on Amazon, you could get it. But with a warning, <laughs> um, the, the Kindle version costs nothing and the hardback costs £58. So yeah. I, I leave it to you. But this sort of tag teaming I'm getting from Michael and Peter, um, there are... Uh, the, the, Michael asks this question, or ma makes this comment, there are no straight lines in nature. This is a fa fairly standard line, there's no straight lines in nature, but all machines have or rely on, or in places, on, on straight lines. Yeah, would you regard that as significant? Would that uh, back up your point or contradict it? Well, uh, yes, I mean, it's not infallible in that as we make machines more and more complicated, they may become rather different from the machines we're familiar with, I don't know. Um, I'd need um, an expert in up to the minute AI to gloss that one. Mm. But uh, I think basically right, the left hemisphere um, has as it were the platonic solids in its mind, but anything that is more complex in shape than that has to be perceived by the right hemisphere, which is the one we rely on for things like faces, which are massively complex. So um, I do think that's right. And in the book, I do actually quote Delacroix, I think it is to the uh, effect that there are no straight lines in nature. Um, and I quote Blake saying, nonsense. Uh, but <laughs> uh, somebody wrote in and said, what about a, a beam of light? Um, I, in one way that's right, but of course light has to travel through space and is subject to the curvature of space as well, I believe. So in any case, I think that's picking holes. Um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the German uh, painter and architect Friedrich Hundertwasser um, once said that um, the straight line is the death of humanity. Uh, and he had a lot of other things, interesting things to say about it. And I know what he means. It is the kind of death of the soul. And it's slightly odd of Blake to have made that tetchy remark, but he was very self-contradictory and he was very tetchy as well as being a genius. Um, <laughs> but uh, because of course he hated the sort of linearity of the mechanistic world and invade against it from the moment he was born, I imagine, to the moment he died. There's, um, there I just, a couple, couple of, sorry. Sorry, can I, just before we have the next question, I, I, I forgot really to point out that, but I'm sure everybody's aware of this, that the, the tendency to try and reduce things to matter 
um, is self-defeating because it's based on the idea that at least we understand what matter is. But in fact, um, the more we know about matter, the less we know what it is. And it certainly is not absolutely is not independent of consciousness. To, to base consciousness on a something that is independent of consciousness is not going to work if you invoke matter. And as um, uh, I think it's um, Adam Frank, a physicist, says, when um, uh, uh, philosophers and neuroscientists come along and say, mm, consciousness is uh, there in physics, you know, and uh, it's all in physics, they think they're being very clever. And he said, we physicists shuffle, look uneasily at our feet and mutter sheepishly. It's more complicated than that. Of course. Yes, that's right. Well, listen, I absolutely apropos that, a couple of people have asked, Peter Bruin again and Christine Smith, have both asked about the emergence of, of consciousness. Do you think the brain is an amplifier of consciousness or a producer? And to give the other version of the same question, could, could inanimate nature, could an inanimate substance ever be capable of consciousness? So there's the old question, is it an amplifier or a producer? And then what, what, what would an inanimate thing ever be able to be conscious like or as? Yes, well, first of all, um... I don't think that consciousness is something secreted by the brain. I think this is one of the silliest and most improbable ideas that was ever put forward. I mean, in years and years and years, decades, possibly a century of teasing this problem, nobody has got a millimetre closer to explaining how that could possibly happen. And as Colin McGinn, no, the philosopher, said, you, you, might, you might as well say that... Sorry, somebody that's talking. You might, you might as well... Um, you might as well say that ethics um, uh, emerged from rhubarb. So um, clearly that is not, not a likely one. I personally take the view that the brain permits consciousness. It doesn't simply transmit. It has a role in shaping it. And in this, it's like a flute that shapes the note. Or, uh, and this is an idea that William James gives. Actually, there's a beautiful quote from Rumi. Um, I, my soul is the breath of Christ as it is played through the flute. So, but, I, but William James gave this idea of rather as the vocal cords shape his voice, that his brain shapes the thing that is him. So I think that for a while, a part of the ultimately always connected consciousness becomes as it were, individuated into whatever it is that's in me at the moment and carries on in some other form, not as me, uh, although uh, as it were, we've all contributed some meaning to the overall consciousness of the cosmos by our existence. And that is the purpose of our existence. On the second question, what would an inanimate universe, uh, sorry, an animate universe look like? Exactly like this one. It is in fact an animate universe. And that was very strongly Schelling's point. And Schelling was, I put money on him being one of the most intelligent people that ever lived. The, th the thing is that we say, well, yes, I know, but it doesn't look like it is, but that's because we do a sort of anthropomorphizing in reverse. If it were conscious, it would do all the things I do with my consciousness. So if the mountain behind my house were consciousness, it ought to be um, mowing the lawn and having a glass of wine and going to Tesco or whatever. But th that's not what mountains do with their consciousness. And uh, I think there is consciousness in, in everything in the universe. So I am a panpsychist, and no doubt you'll be hearing more of that from Philip Goff. Um, I think it's in fact the only rational position, uh, um, something that's argued very strongly by Galen Strawson um, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, and it's, as I say, it is a tradition that goes back a very long way. It goes back not just to Schelling, but of course it goes back to the ancient Greeks. There are gods in all things. So, okay, one little one from Michael Hall, just, just a simple one, and then I've got a very nice question from Gavin Ritchie. Michael Hall's comment is, well, question, is whether the concept of the holograph is useful when you're considering the brain. Is the brain holographic in nature? Yes, it's often said so. I think my answer to that is I'd have to pass because I'm not really familiar enough with the physics of holograms. I did read Jude Curriven's uh, book, which I was rather impressed by. She's a physicist um, and she very much bases the idea on the hologram. 
Um, I, and I also like the idea that um, uh, Tisa and Kafatos have taken building on Arthur Kirstner's idea of the holarchy, that things are sort of, as it were, sets of one another going on in eternally. Um, and that it depends on where you are, what it is that you see. So the gestalt shifts as you move in the cosmos. Um, the bits there, but they just seem different depending on where you're looking at it from. Much as, you know, if you start with the atomic particle and move out to the molecule, to the gene, to the cell, to the organism, to the person, to the society, to the, you know, whatever, you go on into the, into the cosmic realm. And it depends where you are on that track. It could be it could be holographic in that sense. I see that. Well, Gavin has a couple of questions. Do you find any compelling experimental evidence for the hemispheric strengths and weaknesses in split brain patients? Are we talking about leucotomy no. here or something? No, no. Uh, the split brain uh, business is the leucotomy was a um, fairly barbaric procedure which uh, antedated. Um, uh, chlorpromazine for schizophrenia in 1952. Until that time, the only thing that actually seemed to help at all, uh, making people less distressed, was to put a scalpel in and sort of fish about in a rather random way in the frontal cortex. Uh, okay, <laughs> I, I mean, one, brain, then. One, can sit in one can sit in judgment on history, but people had to do what they could at the time. So, but anyway, I mean, obviously, that is not something that goes on. But there is. Um, there is the possibility for a callosotomy in which the two halves of the brain are separated, the corpus callosum, the band of fibers at the base of the brain, which forms the main connection between the two hemispheres, is surgically severed. And uh, my word, yes, I mean, if you read my book, you will see that um, uh, a lot of the information does come from callosotomy patients, but in itself, um, that wouldn't be enough but it's so much in keeping with the literature from lesions. So people who have, uh, say, a stroke or a tumor just confined to one hemisphere, um, you get very similar uh, phenomena confirming the nature of each hemisphere. Um, you can predict what is going to be going on in each hemisphere in the way that you can in the uh, callosotomized or split brain patients. So uh, split brain operations are not done very much now uh, and uh, so we're running out of <laughs> split brain <laughs> patients. They're beginning to die. <laughs> but so a resource for psychology is uh, sadly not, not, not as available as it used to be. Well, um, the other question that Gavin asks is, is, is a bit of a classic in this area. We know that artificial intelligence has already overtaken some narrow human specialisms, such as with IBM Deep Blue's victory over chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov. But what is your view of the possibility of general artificial intelligence? Well, the first thing to say is it's a complete misnomer to call it intelligence. It has nothing to do with intelligence. The, um, the it's, it is, it's, a machine has no intelligence at all. It's entirely stupid, which is why it doesn't see in a way that a chess grandmaster does. Uh, a chess grandmaster only surveys about six possibilities. But the computer can work through all of them, which is why it will eventually, just because it can do it very quickly, because of clever circuitry that we designed and we programmed, quite often with the history, so that the computer knows the past games of Kasparov himself, go to actually <laughs> generate the intelligence of the machine. So really, it's a, it's a misnomer. or uh, It's just a tool, like a like a hammer or a screwdriver, it's useful for doing things we don't normally do with our hands. I can put data into it and it will churn it away and come up with an answer eventually. If it can do it very, very, very fast, it will amaze me. I'll go, oh, must be intelligent, not intelligent at all. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Can I have a, a question of my own? Um, we at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre are going to put on Zoom um, a course on poetry and spirituality. There's going to be a bit of a taster before Christmas, and then we're hoping to do 10 or 12 weeks after Christmas, where there will be these sorts of seminar discussions with poems which will be sent out. Well, the, the notion that poetry is somehow connected to spirituality, I'm rather moving you away from your science and back to your literary origins, or perhaps forward to your spiritual future aspirations. But you, I know, spent all your literary career focused on poetry. 
is there something special either from the point of view of the hemispheres of the brain or more broadly from a philosophical or even religious point of view, which makes it appropriate that one could even imagine such a thing as putting poetry and spirituality together? In other words, I'm, I'm running this course, am I on the right track? <laughs> um, yes, I profoundly believe so. Um, and as you, I know, know, uh, but some of the listeners may not, I have since uh, beginning, of, well, not, not quite the beginning of lockdown, but I've been reading a poem on the internet every day and will continue until I've read 365 poems. Um, but I, I believe they're terribly important. Um, I left the study of literature because I thought that what we were doing to poetry was terrible. And in brief, it is an illumination which led straight into um, my interest in the hemispheres, because what the poem depends on is the ability to contact the implicit in context and the unique in an embodied way. And the study of it made it disembodied, general, decontextualized it, and made the implicit explicit. And in doing so, completely killed it, rather like the kind of taking a part of the piece of music where we've got a note, you know, hmm, good. Um, and I'm not saying that you can't learn something from analyzing a poem, just as you can learn something from analyzing music up to a point, you know, and I'm not saying down to a note, but down to, I see what we're doing, we're shifting harmonically here back to the tonic or whatever it may be. So uh, it has a role, but always as an intermediary, which must then be given back to the right hemisphere, which understands the whole. And in this sense, the left hemisphere is more like a computer. I repudiate the idea that the brain is in any sense like a computer, because it just isn't. But the, um, but the, the left hemisphere is not like the right hemisphere's personal computer. So we have experience through the right hemisphere that goes to the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere doesn't really need to know about it, get involved with the left hemisphere. Goes, oh, it's one of those, it's one of those. I can put them together in that way. And then it gives it back to the right hemisphere, which then says, now I'm going to take the data that the computer has spewed out and turn them back to the original life problem where they came from. So if we don't do that, then we're missing the whole point of the purpose. We've lobbed it to the left hemisphere and it stayed there, which is why we don't understand anything anymore. To come back to the spirituality thing, the right hemisphere is the one that understands the implicit. The right hemisphere is the one that understands the nuanced, the very many meanings, the, the, the thing and its opposite together that makes us feel connected. Language is a very distancing thing when it's used in certain ways. It makes us, it puts a screen between us and reality. But poetry actually connects us immediately. A good poem produces an electric charge in one so that one has found the meaning that one could never have got from an endless prose version of this poem. So I think it's very important. And I'd like to say that in a non-religious age, that one of the very few places in which you can reach the spiritual sense now is in the arts, through music, through poetry, uh, and so forth. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I have a deeply serious question from um, one of our listeners, who, <laughs> which is about, um, it's about President Trump. Um, yeah, is Trump capable of consciousness given enough time and enough puffs? I think the puffs is a reference to the pea shoots, which are intelligent, and I detect satire here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I probably picked up that that one was a, a humorous remark. Um, very <laughs> nice, I love it. I'm not, I can't give you an answer, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah. uh, Patrick, Patrick Moore would have said, but whether we can or not, we just don't know. <laughs> just don't know. That's right. I must say, the whole thing is quite extraordinary, isn't it? And I think that, it, is. it is. I mean, one of the it things that I really have enjoyed here, and I don't know, perhaps we could open up to some people, but there are so many, it's hard to encourage an actual discussion. But one of the things which I'm sure everybody has felt is that Ian, Ian is a syncretist. He, 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 he synthesizes, he brings together um, science and art and spirituality and, and is prepared to laugh at politics. All those different things, there are biological things and there are spiritual things and other things going on in Ian's mind, which he shares in his books. And I think that's, that's really, really important because you know we all know that the problem with um, academia, uh, the intellectual world for over the last 200 years is that we all know more and more about less and less. That's the, that's the famous comment about it. But we could also know um, more and more about more and more if we open our minds. And you know the, the slogan for these talks which we, which we encourage and, and get from people like Ian is open minds, open minds. And I, I really hope that's been what's been happening here. Um, somebody has asked, <laughs> this is an easy question, Ian. Um, 
would you like to say more about the holy? I mean, of course, <laughs> you're going to say there's a pun, aren't you, between holy and holy, but um, what about that? I would, but I, this is disappointing for the questioner, but I think at this stage, it's, it's far too big. I, I would need, I'd need a good hour. Uh, otherwise, I'll not be able to really convey what I mean, because it is the most impossible thing to put into words. Yes, you, you, you quoted my uh, new book. Yeah, uh, um, I sweated blood over it. Um, nothing took me longer than that. And I tried to show how, although when one starts thinking and at the beginning of my book, you may well think that only somebody rather foolish would believe in the divine or the holy. And I think they're importantly related concepts. You can't really have something that's holy unless you believe there's something divine. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's something divine, there will be things that are holy. Um, but uh, it's a very difficult one. And I wanted to lead people to the point where at the end of the book, they would think probably only somebody really rather limited, would think that there wasn't a very strong likelihood that there is something in this idea of the holy and the divine. And I think it's the most important idea. Interestingly, I discovered in, I mean, the most important idea that one's life can engage with. Um, but interestingly, in writing the book, I discovered, uh, because I had to research it, I had no idea that actually one of the things that makes more difference to health, both mental and physical, more than um, exercise more than not smoking, more than controlling diet, more than anything at all, is being engaged with um, a spiritual and preferably community spiritual life. This adds enormously to longevity, to fulfillment, to happiness, and to simple physical health, cancer, cardiovascular things, all the rest. That's, that's a pretty interesting answer about holy. Whatever it is, it's good for you. At least you could say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. I just wanted to say also, I mean, not to put you off from asking another question, but um, I just wanted to say, I do think it's terribly important that it's not just that I was lucky enough to have this maverick career whereby I imbibe things from places. I want people to see that in the end, we have to hold these things together. And there's a place in the world for the specialist. But nowadays, there is no room for the person who is not a specialist. Mm. And that is a great, great shame. And we need people with synoptic vision. And in this book, what I have tried to show is, and this I think increases the likelihood that I'm onto something, that if you look deeply into the neurological literature, deeply into the philosophical literature, and as deeply as someone like me who's not a physicist can into the physics, you approach the same reality just from three different angles. Mm -hmm. And if they're all really leading to the same vision, that increases the likelihood that one's onto something. I think that's terrific. It's, that's a pretty good exit line, but I'm not quite going to let us everybody stop, although I think we must very soon. I'm just going to read out um, the, some of the last uh, little comments that we've had here. Um, thanks. Cheers to absolutely lovely suggestion of, quote, machine is absolutely deprived of intelligence. Thank you for splendid talk. Next talk, please. Let's bring Ian back for another hour. Another talk on the holy, perhaps? Yes, please, let's have another lecture about the holy at a later date. Another talk, please. Couldn't agree more. Yes, encore. Please, could you explain the title of this talk? Oh, a little bit of bathos there. So, <clears throat> could, would you like to end by explaining the title of this talk? Well, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was something like the School of Nothing Battery. That's um, it. Was that right? Yes. yes. Well, it, it's just that there is an academic school to which um, an enormous number of materialist scientists and their um, fellow traveling philosophers like Dennett belong in which everything is reductionist. And the, the end of reductionism is that we are nothing but something else. Now, rather than that, you know, and as I say, there's no end to this process. We're nothing but um, cells. We're nothing but genes. We're nothing but molecules. We're nothing but whatever. Um, and eventually you end up with something you don't even know what it is because it only has a small probability of being anywhere at all. And physicists can't tell you anything about its nature except that it's dependent on consciousness. So, I mean, I think that's what you're on a hiding to nothing going in that direction. Um, and I also very much like something I read in my 20s, which was 
uh, a saying of Joseph Needham, you know, the great Chinese scholar, I mean, scholar of Chinese culture and civilization and science, um, that, uh, as it were, life can't be reduced to matter because nothing can ever be reduced to anything. And I thought, good point. And it's really something that I, in one way and another, say in the book that actually nothing is something else. As soon as you've said it's something else, you have actually something else, not what you originally had. Just like when you say this poem is, or this piece of music is, these whatevers, now you don't have the music, now you don't have the poem, you have something else. So rather than say that we are nothing but something else, I would say that we don't know yet the whole of what we are. We can't in fact know, uh, and actually being bright and on the case is usually marked by a strong awareness that that is the reality, that we can't know certain things, mm. which doesn't mean we give up. It's, there's a lovely rabbinical saying, you are not obliged to finish the task, but you may not desist from it. And I think that you know, one has to keep trying to learn. And um, far from that we are uh, this squalid apes, you know, it seems to me that um, we are something rather more wonderful and the things that we really value are more wonderful than we can really know. Uh, maybe I'll just finish that remark with um, a saying of Emerson Pugh, who is a nuclear physicist. He says, if the human brain was so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. <laughs> That's very good, isn't it? Yes, indeed. We like it very much. Well, listen, there are one or two more comments, but I think that may be that may, you, you may have delighted us long enough. <laughs> um, I, I would best, like best put down in the history of literature. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, there, actually, there are a couple of other little things that people have said. Um, super talk, thanks. And um, nothing could be reduced to anything is my mantra for today says um, mm. says Elena Stoeva. Nothing can be reduced to anything. Nothing can be reduced to anything else. It seems a very good one. No. Well, listen, th th this has been terrific. I, I, let me just remind everybody that we have these talks most Tuesday evenings. They will be desisting over Christmas and the New Year, as most of you know. And we've got lots of wonderful people coming. And quite obviously, by popular acclamation, Ian is going to be lured back. I would hope physically from the Isle of Skye, but if not, at least like this. So you're getting your emails, I hope, from, from Scott, who is in the top left-hand corner of the gallery view with the name Arthur Conan Doyle next to him, I think. Um, and <laughs> and on our website contains information about all this. But we do have, on Saturday nights, we always or nearly always have, at this same time, mediumship demonstrations with some very interesting mediums. And we have all sorts of other classes and talks and things which are available to you for a small fee. And it's wonderful how many people are joining in. And and this, the silver lining of all this coronavirus business is that at least we find that you know, if Ian had come to the centre, there might have been 20 or 30 people. Unlikely, I think there would have been 55, which we've had tonight. That kind of thing is the, is the golden lining of, of all this Zooming. And of course, people from outside Edinburgh, at the very least. So next week, we have, we have David Punter on, on, on magic and the Gothic which were quite interesting. And then the week after we have Philip Goff on the panpsychism of which we've heard this evening. But what I really want to say is, Ian, that was a marvellous talk. Thank you very much indeed. I think people will do the regulation, you know, silent clapping that goes on here. And I'm going to say thank you to everybody for coming. Look forward to seeing you again. And good night. I'm trying to leave. Leave. Leave meeting. Can we have the... the, the uh... My website, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian.